Now we're live. Here we go. <laughs> that was wonderful. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. I'm live here at TMS Roundtable from Israel. It is 10 o'clock and Rose, I am in all one more week <laughs> of you to get up so early in the morning to meet me here with another wonderful guest. So I send my, my love and regards to you in Melbourne, Boker Tov. Good morning, Rose. Good morning, Tova. This morning, we have got Dr. Alan Eppel, author of Sweet Sorrow. Can you see it? <laughs> yeah, look at love, that. Love, loss, and attachment in human life. We're going to talk about how it is that we, we have this um, desire to be attached always and sometimes it's it's put on hold or it's stymied i don't know if that's a, yes. the right word yeah. and of course it creates an emptiness feeling and when dr um ethel wrote this lovely book a few years ago now um it actually touches that human experience of when we lose someone or we don't even have we have this this loss and this sorrow and thank you, Dr. Apple, for coming on board. And also, would you give the audience a bit of a background about your um, position at McMaster University and what drew you to this ISTDP sort of um, uh, understanding of psychiatry? Because it's so lovely to, to have a psychiatrist like you that actually delves into that rather than look at the symptoms, you're looking at the cause of the symptoms. So thank you for coming on board. You're welcome and thank you for having me. So if you want me to talk about myself, that's very easy. <laughs> um, so I am... Um, Don't be shy. Don't be I, shy. I grew up in Dublin, Ireland, and I came to Canada with my wife. We immigrated in a long time ago. And what attracted us was McMaster University, which is a very interesting medical school. And I trained in psychiatry. But I always felt that you know, medicine is not just medications or procedures. It's the human dimension that's so important. And that was always very central. And that was borne out in the types of patients that I was seeing who often had very disturbed attachment relationships and were very ill, traumatized, early trauma. And, um, you know, they this led to often suicide attempts and self-harm and so forth. So I felt very important that we have a an approach that looks at both the illness if there's an illness but also deals with the person who has the illness and their response to the illness and what what predisposes them and i underwent psychotherapy training in my residency but years later i went on to to study with diana fosch's group in new york uh, in the early 2000s to take extra training and Diana Fosha trained with Davin Lu, so her early training was very much into Davin Lu, but she broke away and developed um, a similar type of therapy based on the same principles, but a different style, more um, gentler style, a more empathic style, I would say. And the goals of both therapies, ISTTP and Diana Fosha's therapy and other therapies is to get to deep emotions, to get to the unconscious issues. And that involves getting past defenses and getting to the core deep emotions. Well said. And attachment is the model that's used nowadays a lot more than classical psychoanalysis. I mean, it's, it's all derived from that, but it's developed in leaps and bounds with the uh, beginning of Bowlby's attachment theory in the 50s and 60s. So you can look at all types of psychotherapy based on the model of human attachment so that the therapist and the patient need to develop a secure attachment. So I should, if you want, just talk a little bit about what attachment really is. That would be lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. you know, I, I just want you to know that I, you know, I've been in the field for a long time and though I've, it's, I've not really connected to that word to the, to the, 
even to the, the chronic pain and autoimmune war patients we see. And I'm just fast, it's, it's, it's an important, it's, it's, it's an essential. And it's not something that comes up uh, and it's such a big part of ICDP and such an important part to help people. You know, and I, 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 I want to hear what you want to say, but I was just looking, um, you know, Dr. Gaber Matai, Matei, mm -hmm. he talks a lot about attachment and authenticity. And when we had Marvin on the show, remember Rose, he talked about attachment and authenticity. So I'm hearing now, that, you know, it's always like you, if you think pink cars, you'll start to see pink cars. It's such an important thing. And I'm, I'm so grateful to be around people and learning about what it is. Cause I think when I first heard it from Rose, I, I was sort of, what does that mean? Like, where do I put that in? Like, how do I understand that? So thank you. No problem. <laughs> so I would say that attachment and separation, love and loss is the central issue in human life. This is what human life is all about and it's unavoidable attaching and losing love and loss and to me love is the subjective part of attachment behaviors and i'll explain that loss is inevitable in human life so this dynamic of wanting to attach to other human beings but knowing that we're going to face loss is universal now obviously we don't keep it in front front and center because it, it's a painful thought, but COVID has, in fact, put that on the front burner much more than before. Mm, it has. It has. Um, so we're, we're more aware of it, but it's, it's always been there. And how do, we, how do we deal with that love and loss? And sweet sorrow comes from Romeo and Juliet. Parting is such sweet sorrow. What does yeah. that mean? That sounds like oxymoron. <laughs> well, if you're parting from your loved one, it's painful, but there's a positive sense of loving, like nostalgia. Nostalgia is a mixture of sadness and something positive, a, a loving feeling. So the two are blended when um, Juliet and Romeo have to part. I mean, it's nothing can be expressed more forcefully than in those few lines of the desperation that they're going to have to separate very soon because it's the morning and yet the the sense of love and attachment so attachment is fundamental to human life attachment is a matter of life and death we, human beings would not survive without attachment in terms of evolution um, infants need the security of the parent so infants are hardwired to seek proximity to the parent. And I'm going to say mother sometimes that, of course, different people may be the primary attachment figure, but I'll use the word mother for convenience. So an animal in the wild, if the animal wanders away from its mother, they're going to get killed. They're going to get eaten by predators. So the only way they can be protected, fed and nurtured is by being close by to the mother and fed and so attachment in that sense is a, a matter of life and death humans depend on protection food nurturing for a long time after they're born so attachment is essential and we are hardwired for attachment that means there are neuro circuits in the infant and neuro circuits in the parent that are reciprocal so the infant seeks proximity and the parent responds within a protective way. And this is governed by different neuro circuits, different parts of the brain, different chemicals, including dopamine, oxytocin, prolactin, and the opioid system, which may be of interest mm -hmm. to you particularly. So that's what attachment is. Now, what does it look like? Well, if you've all had or seen little toddlers and little children, um, moving away, beginning to gain independence, but running back or crawling back to the mother. Attachment consists of four main things. One, proximity seeking. Got to be close to the mother. Got to be safe. 
got to be mother is the secure base. So get back to the secure base. Mm -hmm. Two, separation distress. When you start leaving the secure base, you start getting distressed, crying, you know, making sounds, vocalizations, and movements that distress movements, and scurrying back to the secure base. Thirdly, going back to the secure base is the safe haven. Going back, it's the same place, but we call that the safe haven. And fourthly, internal working models, which I'll explain what that is. So the process of growing up, developing in the first three years of life is very dependent on a proper attachment relationship. And a proper attachment relationship involves a response from the care, care, caregiver. The primary caregiver or the primary attachment figure, maybe the mother, maybe somebody in the extended family, maybe the father, or one of the fathers, one of the mothers, and so forth. But there is somebody who's usually the predominant attachment figure. And they have to be responsive, adequately responsive to the infant's needs. So the infant has needs for food, warmth, soothing, uh, relief of pain. And there is an optimal level of responsiveness by the, the mother figure. You can't respond 100% of the time to the infant's needs. Wow. And it's not actually a good idea either. And Winnicott, the famous British pediatrician psychoanalyst, talked about good enough mothering. It's not 100% responsiveness, and you don't want 100%. And work by Tronic and others has demonstrated mm -hmm. that about 30% of the time, the mother figure adequately is adequately attuned and responsive to the in infant 30 percent of the time she's not available you know she might be tied up in something else and can't get there in time and the big thing is 30 percent of the time she's doing repair and this is critical for psychotherapy wow. Wow. tell you why yeah. mm -hmm. so you have miscoordination you, you, when you're not attuned but then you repair the damage so repair, and in psychotherapy we call it rupture and repair, repair promotes resilience. Wow. Now, if you think about it, it makes sense. If you are having your needs met 100% of the time, then you never learn to overcome adversity because you never experience it. When you've experience lack of attunement with that you're lying there and you want some food or you want some warmth or you want some um, pain relief nobody's coming you know they've been coming every day and they've been giving me milk so you know what's happened and you panic and you're scared but then after a while somebody just comes oh okay so even though they didn't come in you know, the next time they don't come i'm not so scared because i've learned that things yeah. can be solved so that's resilience Wow. And there is research evidence to show that that type of attachment, a normal attachment, a healthy attachment, increases children's resilience. Wow. Um, so stress on the system. Yes. Yeah. And repair. Yeah. And repair. Yeah. Yeah. And in psychotherapy, we talk about a rupture in the relationship when there's a lack of attunement by the therapist with the patient. And then having to repair the rupture as being one of the most powerful interventions wow. in psychotherapy yeah. because it's about the relationship in the room. Mm. So modern forms of psychotherapy like ISTDP and AEDP, which is Diana Fosch's and affect phobia therapy developed by Lee McCullough in Boston. Uh, in my other book on psychotherapy, I think they're all basically the same with differences in style, but the fundamental things is, thank you. Thank you from our sponsor. <laughs> um, I think they're, they're fundamentally the same process, but the main change from classical analysis is 
relational, the focus on the, the real and the transference relation, but it, much more focus. Um, even before what's now called relational psychoanalysis, this was being done by Davin Liu and Fosher and others, really emphasizing the relationship. So what happens in the room is much more therapeutic than what happens outside the room. You can talk about it, but it's wow. much more powerful when it's happening between you and the patient. Whereas, you know, they may talk about, well, my parents did X, Y, and Z, and this has traumatized me, or my current relationship is traumatizing or damaging. But when it happens in the room and you repair it, it's much more powerful and promotes resilience and uh, health. So the attachment model sort of is a model for psychotherapy. It's a parallel model. Now, is it exactly the same? I don't know, but we can use it as a parallel model. So what happens with the infant and the, the mother parallels what happens with the therapist and the patient, and we can use the same concepts. Instead of using a lot of interesting but difficult to understand concepts from earlier writers who are very hard for um, younger therapists to, to really relate to. It's like I say, um, you can learn English literature without learning Greek and Latin. You can learn Greek and Latin and it will give you some added dimensions, but you don't have to learn Greek and Latin. Um, so the same with, I think, with ISTDP and uh, ADP, modern experiential dynamic therapies. Um, you don't have to learn Melanie Klein and Freud in any great depth at all. In fact, that might be certainly for the, I'm also, uh, I supervise psychodynamic psychotherapy with psychiatry residents and they don't relate to that. It's not part of their, their world, but they can relate to attachment. And the other part of attachment is our model of the world. So in the course of your development, in a secure attached relationship, you develop a sense of yourself and a sense of the other person, which boldly called the internal working models. So you begin to develop as your brain develops cognitively, you develop unconsciously and out of awareness, a sense of what other people are like and a sense of how you feel about yourself those people who have secure attachment feel good about themselves and they feel good about other people. They trust them and they're able to relate them. Those people who've had bad attachment experiences, including abuse or neglect or even more subtle problems, they feel unworthy. They feel ungood about, not good about themselves and they may perceive other people as critical or hostile or rejecting or abandoning or aggressive or abusing. So we grow up with these internal models of other people and that affects the people we choose to get married to or have relationships with. It affects how we react to people in authority, bosses or physicians or other. So attachment is responsible for our view of ourselves and others and in the old language for those in the audience who are familiar with it, that is a new way of talking about object relations. We're not talking about some of the complicated language of object relations. It's much more simple as an internal working model. View of yourself, yeah. view of others. Yeah. And we also t talk about transactional. Uh, how, how does it put, it's our transactional pattern as well. And, and in therapy, we, we notice that and we expose it so people can actually see that their transactional pattern is creating the suffering, really, can't they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I yeah. use the term, there are different terms for that. I use the term relational focus or relational theme. Other people use um, core conflictual relationship theme, which came yeah. from Laborski in Pennsylvania. But it's basically the recurrent patterns that we have. And human beings are actually very simple. We all have repetitive patterns, <laughs> Surprise, you know, and there's not that many of them, you know, and this goes back to our ancient reptilian brain, because reptiles repeat 
the same patterns, you know, they come back to the same place. So we have some of that left over. And our interpersonal patterns, though, are really um, determined by our attachment early relationships to a large part. And so yeah. Yeah. we unconsciously repeat them. Yeah. Can you expand that now to mood? Alan has got 11 propositions that he says in his book. And the first four are of acute interest to people that are, have chronic pain. And, and those four, um, uh, what did you call them? Um, uh, propositions, action. sorry. Propositions, yeah. yeah. Um, are about striving to connect mm. and how when we don't connect really properly, we, our mood varies. And in his introduction, he talked about the peptides and, and um, neurotransmitters that are excreted in our brain. And that's the, as he says here, mood is the bedrock of identity and the sense of self. And, you know, if we've got a problem with our sense of self, it's going to show up in the body. Would you expand on that a little bit more, please? Right. So you can look at attachment and the attachment interaction between mother and infant as a method of emotional regulation. So the baby cries and the mother responds and the baby stops crying. That is mood regulation. And there is a body of work that says secure attachment promotes the internal development of the capacity for your own mood regulation. Impaired attachment leads to problems with emotional regulation, so you may be emotionally dysregulated or overregulated. And the names we have for that are things like avoidant attachment or preoccupied attachment. And it, it's less than optimal, but a secure attachment promotes good emotional capacity to regulate emotions. And during the course of brain development, um, that capacity develops. Now, on one extreme, we have what's known as um, borderline personality, which I call a disorder of insecure attachment and emotional dysregulation. It's absolutely an attachment disorder. Wow. And the problem with it is that the individual has no secure attachment, is frantic about being alone, constantly seeks um, being attached, and is fearful, very fearful alone. And the, the, the search for attachment is actually proximity seeking, not attention seeking. People often say that um, these patients are attention seeking, they're not attention seeking, they're proximity seeking. They want to have an attached relationship. So attachment security or insecurity modulates mood and pain perception is also modulated by uh, your mood. They all interact and secure attachment can help you cope and modulate whatever the adverse experiences are. So, excuse me, you're saying that mood is externally affected. Like it's our mood be, is because of how we're interacting. So it's it's not a nature, it's a nurture thing. It's both, but it's what's very critical in terms of um, mood regulation throughout life is a secure attach, attachment. There are some genetic components and prenatal components, but the regulation of attachment experiences is a big one. And in later life, um, in terms of pain, and I'm not a, an expert in pain, but I will say this, that pain of loss and pain from physical disorders is very similar in terms of the brain. It, it's represented in, in similar, or the same areas of the brain. So the subjective feeling of grief and depression is very similar 
to what we call physical pain. And both are interacting. If you're depressed or anxious and you have physical pain, it makes the physical pain worse. If you have physical pain, your depression and anxiety is going to get worse. And they interact. An interesting twist on the attachment story is how does your partner respond to your pain? What is their attachment style? Are they avoidant and can't talk about it? Or are you avoidant and don't want to burden them with the pain? You feel guilty. So the attachment just between the couple, if there's a couple, uh, yeah. is another dimension to this. Yeah. Exactly. It becomes it's, another in, 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 trans, transactional pattern. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. That's the pattern. That's you know, between you and the therapist, between you and the person. It's like, you know, it's like there's play that we. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Do we have a few patterns, or is usually one? I mean, like it just it depends. Like. I think there's more than one, but there are some predominant ones. Yeah, there can be many ones, but there's usually two or three patterns that predominate. But when you're talking about couples, in terms of individuals throughout life, surprisingly, there's often one main, when you were talking about relationships, romantic relationships, and close relationships, it's often one particular pattern that crops up. Um, for example, feeling that you're never good enough, that the other people are judging you, that you're not worthy. For example, that's one pattern, very common pattern. Mm -hmm. Or having to be self-sacrificing because you feel the other person's going to leave or abandon you. Another very common pattern, self-sacrifice, uh, very common in our culture anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Another component of, of sweet sorrow, which I... I didn't realize until I read that book, or maybe it was in your book other again. book. Rose, can you show the book again? Because there's some new viewers. Oh. Yeah, I just. Oh, okay. The Sweet Sorrow. Uh, yeah. One of one of the things that I noticed is in our brain, the the area of of our um, oxytocin and the area of our aggression are are on top of each other. It almost seems like it's going. They slide in together. I don't know if I've explained it quite well, but can you explore that a little bit more? Because in in therapy, we look at rage and we look at anger and we try and help the patient integrate that, but yet it's there in the brain. And, and I understood it from reading that book, I understood it a little bit more deeply than I did previously. Can you explore that for our audience? Because it's it's important to see that that, that rage that the child has is is actually there's good reason for it put it that way <laughs> and it's, it soaks in right so there's always been a big debate since the time of freud whether rage and aggression are instinctual inborn or whether they are reactive to some mm. deprivation or loss or threat um either way very often in therapy there is lots of rage and anger about things that have happened in the past or certain people. And that blocks the resolution of many of the issues. Or it, the suppression of rage also accompanies or causes suppression of other positive emotions. So they're all kind of defended and pushed down so that the person comes and says, I don't feel anything. You know, I feel my emotions are, I can't get in touch with my emotions. They're all blocked off. And both sadness and rage need to be dealt with in therapy to, re to resolve that. And you flip back and forth in the course of therapy. Sometimes the sadness is m uppermost and then that leads to underlying rage or sometimes it's the other way around, but both often will need to be processed in people that have been, particularly those who've been traumatized, um, to resolve um, resolve the fact that they're unable to get in touch with their emotions. Now, Winnicott beautifully talks about the false self, which is a lovely concept, the true self and the false self. So people growing up in an environment where there is a poor attachment environment where they're um, they, 
they have to conform to the demands of the parent figures. They can't be themselves. Their spontaneous self cannot emerge because they have to be conforming to an abusive or demanding parent. So they grow up with a sense of lack of sharpness of their emotions. And to break through to that, they need to feel securely attached in therapy and then able to um, get past defenses to the feelings of sadness and anger. And sometimes the anger is very intense and needs to be validated and normalized. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, Karen has got a oh, good yes, question yes. here. Yeah. Bring it up. Yes, please. I think Karen has studied some ISTDP. She's in Israel and she's shared before. So I'll read the question. Why is the focus on emotional regulation? Secure attachment is also required for arousal regulation, which is necessary for proper performance. And of course, arousal regulation and emotional regulation are tightly linked. Right. So emotion, uh, arousal regulation um, is necessary to be at an optimal level for learning and for psychotherapy to take place. So people may remember that when you're trying to learn something, study for exams, too much anxiety is paralyzing, too little anxiety, you don't care, so you don't study. So in therapy, there's an optimal level of arousal. Uh, too much is makes it hard to work through the process and needs to be reduced, and too little doesn't engage the emotions adequately. Now, ISTDP has ways of uh, monitoring those levels of anxiety, which is different from ADP. We don't use that same physiological monitoring of striatal muscle and smooth muscle and cognitive disorganization. So those are methods within ISTDP to give you a sense of the level potential levels of arousal that patients may exhibit and determine um, you know whether they can how much they can tolerate um, in ADP the other experiential therapies we use um, affect to guide that you know and signs of anxiety obviously if the person is too um, anxious and aroused we may need to slow things down, you know, slow down, focus, even use a little bit of mindfulness, focusing to bring the anxiety down to a level that you can proceed with the therapeutic work. I, 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 when we were talking um, earlier this week, I was very interested in what you were saying about pain and depression in the brain, the could you repeat that? In the very beginning, it was beautiful, what you shared with Rose and I. Well, there's a couple of things. One is the areas of the brain, but what was very interesting is that when people in animal experience, back in, back in the 70s animal experience, when rats were removed from their mother, mm -hmm. they experienced separation anxiety, separation distress, which is determined by the sounds they make, so called separation vocalizations. And the Jakob Pankseb, who was doing these studies in the States, tried different medications to see if they could soothe the separation distress. And they tried sedative drugs, antidepressants. None of them really worked. What did work were the opiates. Mm. So the opiates soothe separation distress. So to cut a long story short, we know that the opiate receptors are part of the pain of separation distress and of grief and probably depression. Um, so separation distress is connected with opiates, as is obviously physical pain. Now, interesting connection is Many of the people on what we call the Lower East Side of Vancouver in Canada, which has a huge substance abuse 
population where Gabor Mate, who you mentioned, a family doctor, worked, has worked for years, and he says, drug addiction is nothing to is not about drugs. It's about no. attachment. Wow. <laughs> it's about lack of attachment, and these yeah. people have had the most disturbed attachment experiences. So what are they doing to soothe their mu receptors, their opiate receptors? They're taking heroin, mm -hmm. which soothes some of those attachment deficits. So this is just a fascinating going from the rat experiments to realizing that heroin addiction is not about addiction so much as it is about attachment. Wow. It's tragic, isn't it? Really tragic. Yeah. We know that. We know that. We know that about prisoners. We know that about criminals. Yeah. We know that they're they're all children that have post traumatic stress disorder and are you know a victim of their family and some of them don't have to be in other words this is what this is not a you know a permanent situation because we've seen so much change and we've seen but well it's intergenerational I, trauma isn't yeah, it yeah yeah and it, yeah. it makes me think again of how a psychiatrist the balance of what you do, Dr. Ipel, is just so important for the profession. And um, I hope it's a sign of the future of what psychiatrists, that they can, be, can t they can treat the person as well as the condition, because that's what you're doing every day and then teaching. And so it's just, I'm thrilled. And you, you're, you're mm -hmm. also able, as a professor, you're, you're also explaining things very simple. And I, I'm enjoying listening to you. Yeah. Thank you. Can, can you put up Phyllis's question? Because um, Alan has actually spoken against that question already, but yeah. maybe we need to talk about it a little bit more. Hmm. Oh. Do you want me to respond to that? How does, yes, how, does one, how does one heal from attachment trauma? Is that the question? Yep. Mm -hmm. So, yes. yeah. well, psychotherapy is generally accepted absolutely has been essential for healing from attachment trauma. Now, which psychotherapy is another kettle of fish? And there are many different types that have been accepted, for example, in the Veterans Administration in the US and so on. I think it, it's not short term. It's, you know, it's two or three years, by and large, for trauma. And I think also it may involve sequential therapies, not necessarily just one type of therapy. And I've had that experience with some of my patients. But primarily, again, establishing a trusting, secure base with your therapist. That's number one. And that may take a period of time. And then um, getting in touch, not, necess not necessarily repeating all the trauma, and certainly, in fact, not doing that, but being able to get in touch with some of the, the pain and the and um, changing the narrative in the course of therapy by going through it together, uh, developing a relational sense, we will go through this together, nice. which is uh, an attachment style of phrase. We will get through this together and helping... See, what happens with trauma memories is in what you would call unlocking the unconscious, or I would call getting to core affect, is the emotions come up, but the emotions are linked to memories. They're, they're tied together in the brain, in the amygdala, and the hippocampus. So they come up. And all of the trauma therapies, whether it's psychodynamic, cognitive behavioral, EMDR, um, cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure, all of those therapies produce a similar effect, which is breaking the connection between the extreme pain of the trauma and yeah. the memory. So the memories become yeah. deactivated or neutralized. So the person may say, I'm still getting some of the memories, but they don't bother me the same way. Yeah. In yeah. modern language, um, you know, you see the word tagging on the internet. And say, Your picture was tagged. So these memories have been tagged with pain. Wow. So now we want to remove the tag. Yeah. And the Separated. memories and you in the course of therapy, you're changing the narrative from 
it wasn't all your fault as you feel in the memory now after we've talked about it and you know the perspective changes the narr you, the narrative is rewritten and in some therapies they do that very deliberately with what we call portrayals and dynamic experience therapy where you change the narrative with a portrayal in cbt you may know you'd be surprised to know they have exactly the same concept but they call it uh, imagery rescripting imaginal rescripting exactly the same concept that's the thing about cbt they take all our concepts <laughs> 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 Alan, would you, um, following on again from Phyllis's question, um, speak about the fact that when a patient goes to therapy or goes to the psychiatrist, there's a feeling of distrust and breaking, breaking that distrust down and creating um, a safe environment. And many times it takes over several weeks to do that. And I'd imagine in, in a clinical setting in the hospital, it's probably even more difficult because you've got different staff, different people coming in, and there's no one uh, uh, secure or whatever. Could you explore that a little bit more for patients? For the I'll, give you, I'll give you the magical solution to that problem. Oh, good. Right here. When I, when, <laughs> I first, <laughs> when, when I first saw Diana Fosha's video years and years ago, the first thing she said to the it was a real patient. It was it was a one a once one off session done with a real patient, and no background. One of the first things she said to the patient was, "Welcome." I said, "What? <laughs> I've never heard anybody, any doctor, <laughs> in my hospital ever say welcome <laughs> to a patient." <laughs> so what's going on here? So that's that's so that is totally disconfirming of their previous experience. They're coming. Patients are coming with their internal working model. They have expectations that this may not go so well. I'm going to be anxious. Maybe they're going to hospitalize me. Maybe they're going to be make me feel ashamed. So they're coming in. So immediately you can start breaking that expectation you know, and starting to work on a corrective emotional experience because you're different from all the other experiences. So my opening question now with a new patient is first question you know not not your name and address we have all that already not your main problem my first question is how do you feel about coming to see me today oh, wow and that blows them away because they've never been asked that before we're getting right into the relational stuff how do you feel about coming to see me today not just coming to this clinic or whatever or coming to see a doctor, coming wow. to see me, because they already know something about me. They've probably, they might have Googled me, or they might have heard good things, or they might have heard bad things. But so I make it very personal right from the beginning, and that is, it tells them we're doing things differently too. We're wow. not just here to say, you know, uh, you know, how is your appetite? How is your sleep? How is your weight? How is your mood? And when you ask a checklist of questions the reliability of the answers that you get back is very low because people get flustered and they're just, how's your appetite? Oh, it's fine. And then later on you learn it wasn't really fine, but that's, you know, they couldn't think. It's their anxiety, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, so in that instance, could you explain to the audience what your mind is thinking about when you ask that question? Because you're welcoming the person, you're trying to get to know the internal workings of the person, but... Tell us how you uh, acknowledge the anxiety because the patient's going to be taken aback. So what's the result then when they're taken aback? So two things. One is they may say, yes, I was very anxious. Yep. Then I will explore that. I don't move on to the next question. It stay with yep. that and see where it goes. Or if there's a visible, if they don't say anything and they're taken aback physically, I'll say, I noticed that you, you know, you went back. Uh, yeah. You, you were shocked by my question. Tell me how you reacted to my question. Yeah. And that's or or how, how about if they're like, uh, you know, I'll let you know at the end of the session. And then you see their interactional pattern of how they're reacting. Yes, to yes. Like, it's not it doesn't work like that, though. <laughs> yeah. That's so not what happens. 
I mean, I'll stay with it a while and see how far it goes. If I'm stonewalled, then I'll have to move on. You know, but um, there's usually something you can go and and you you're demonstrating. You know, you're also testing, if you like, Davin Luce trial of therapy. Can they tolerate? Yeah. these kind of interventions wow. yes that's what we're doing in actual it's very practice, intimate it? it's very intimate right away well, it, yes. needs to be, it needs to be because it's about attachment so the more intimate the better and and as um as as alan actually explains he gets intimate straight away about your feelings and that's mm -hmm. what's been happening in um in the and early I, day. and i yeah. encourage uh, my students to do that even when they're not uh, consulting someone for psychotherapy, just for general psychiatric treatment, because you have to have a proper therapeutic relationship at the human level. You have so to have a good attachment with all your patients. So, you know, you can start off, and I've had um, recently teaching even uh, staff psychiatrists who felt they couldn't answer that. They couldn't ask that question. They thought the patient would react, and they went back and said, "We'll try that and see what happens." And they came back and said. It was amazing. The person opened up. They never opened up before with me. I've known them for years, and they had never opened up about wow. these issues. Yeah, yeah, it's wow. beautiful. Yeah, wow. but for, for any therapists out there watching, um, it's a very hard sort of move to move across to ask people about their feelings initially, and yet it's the most therapeutic thing you can do for a person. It's a it's a beautiful experience from from a therapist's point of view, and from a patient's point of view. It. Um, it connects you straight away. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was never asked it, and I see Rose doing it, you know, with with clients, and um, and it's it's powerful, and it's it's it speaks a lot. And sometimes there there I say I don't know, and then Rose has an opportunity to, you know, so it can go many different places. But I'm I'm really happy you brought that up. <laughs> we didn't talk about that before, but that was it's very profound. But it's helping people who. When the doctor doesn't ask that, they can say, they can, t what am I feeling? You know, I'm feeling a little nervous being here. Yes. So Absolutely. It's they, they might be nervous. They might be angry because somebody else told them they should come. They don't want to be here. If you don't actually deal with that up front, yeah. then the interview is not going to go well uh, because they're yeah. not comfortable. Yeah. Excellent. And it's going to go yeah. downhill. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah. And you see that, um, like when they go to a GP, for example, or whatever, um, patients, if they're not asked that question or similar, similar question, all they ever tell their patient, all they ever tell their doctor is the presenting problem and they never expand on it, you know. Um, you know I've, got a, yeah. an, I've, I've got an ache here and that's it. And then they're given uh, anti-inflammatory anti or something for an ache. But it's an ache of the heart that they really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, um, like Michael Ballant in England, you know, who developed GPs, the the idea that the doctor is is the medication, the relationship, you know, yeah. and your availability and your interaction is the dose, and so he introduced that. But it's very hard to sustain that under the current working conditions, and things seem to have speeded up so much. Um, family doctors limit their sessions to a short time often they don't have the time and so on so we've lost that and um it's unfortunate yeah well there's a book um called the patient will see you now mm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so things are changing it's yes little by little yeah little well you know little. i i think that um it's been demonstrated that um, any doctor or any nurse or any health professional that asks those questions first, the interview doesn't take any longer, but the patient actually gets satisfaction. You can still only give them the five or 10 minutes, but when you, when you actually bring up that subject, they can then come back for another interview or they can be referred. And, um, and in Queensland, um, there's a number of, um, health professionals that are actually outside the psychiatry area, but they're using that model in the hospital. And the patient's pain management goes down and they don't, they go home quicker and there's a whole lot of feedback. 
um, yeah. out there about how much better the patient feels just by being asked what else is happening in your life. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah, oh, wow. <laughs> so I know yeah. you have to leave in 10 minutes. So if anyone in our audience and our listeners has a question for Dr. Alan Appel, um, I know you're all wanting to know about the picture of his book, but maybe we'll just wait till he comes back again to talk about the picture in front of his oh, book. Oh, please talk, please <laughs> talk right about my the turn. picture. Okay. Show the picture again. I mean, I just want to say that Rose and I met with Dr. Appel a few days ago, and the three of us had three different views of what that picture was. It was totally three different views. So I'm sure there's about 10 other views out there. If anybody wants right. to comment on the picture, it's, it's, it's just a fascinating picture. And um, we'd love to hear about what, how, how it came down to the book and if you got fired or you fired your editor or what happened. <laughs> okay, so this, picture is taken by a famous Belgian photographer, Christopher Gilbert, and a friend of mine, a psychiatrist from Brazil, actually, had sent me some of his pictures, and they're very clever. And I sent it to the publisher to put as an illustration in one of the chapters, and they decided to put it on the front cover, which I thought was actually very good. So what, what chapter would it be under it? Uh, the very early chapter, Attachment. Uh, attachment. Yeah, because this is illustrative of the, if you like, the hardwired or instinctual nature of attachment where the the mother uh, is fiercely protective of her baby. And you can think of a tiger maybe holding their cub in their okay. mouth okay. and fiercely protective. But different people see it differently. And in that sense, it's a bit of a projective test. So some people feel it's delightful and they feel it's, you know, really strong and, and protective. Other people feel that the baby is at risk or it's going to be harmed. Of course, the picture was photoshopped, and, you know, not actually holding the baby in her mouth. And, but when I look at the baby, the baby is, is happy. I see the baby is smiling. Mm -hmm. And I see the mother is not so much angry as fiercely protective. But the, but the main idea of, of the diagram is to show that this is a very inborn evolutionary pattern that mammals, all mammals have of protecting infants. When you go beneath the mammals, uh, they don't have that protective um, instinct. And so that's, that's the picture on the book. Yeah. And I like the uh, I like the fact that the woman is is naked as well, because it sort of brings out that primordial thing, right. that this is where my instinct is that uh, I'm going to protect that infant no matter what, right. and uh, and the infant of course even looks like involved in a way the way yeah. it's been put together the infant is sort of mouth open eyes open so curious um, engaged with with that primordial sort of mother and the fact that she's naked i just think when i saw that picture i thought yes as a midwife that's how i see mothers <laughs> as they're birthing i love it i just love it and i love your whole book yeah. i just Thank love you. it and i love your 11 propositions and i love the first four very much <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and i'll love the book when i finally get it in the mail and read it and uh yeah but um, I, I, I want to say how, how primal, I mean, you know, we talk about chronic pain, a lot of Dr. Schubiter and Dr. Schechter, and um, they talk about the, the, you know, when we were cavemen, how we would, we would use our fight and flight mechanism to help us. So we're not talking, we're talking about a balance, you know, a balance and a, a knowledge, I think a knowledge, I think it's profound, the knowledge we're learning and, uh, my, you know, the future would be wonderful for people to learn. And when people understand that pain is not a bad thing, pain can be a good thing, that it's something innate in us. Uh, I just think the education of what you've given us tonight and what, you know, Rose and I have been, you know, blessed to be able to do is just what's going to help people be um, so much more independent, interdependent with their doctors, with their relationships. And I'm really thrilled thrilled to meet you and we, we, if anyone else has any questions after the show we'll we'll send them your way up to toronto but we're we're just 
I know I'm really happy to meet you. And Rose, thank you so much for finding this gem and bringing them on our show. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for, yeah, thank you for finding me. I really enjoyed uh, meeting the two of you. And I think you've obviously put together a great following of people and doing great work and helping people with chronic Thanks, pain. Mom. And yeah. uh, and that's uh, really good. Yeah, and um, Mia just asked, I think the book is written for pa for patients. It's not just for... It's, it's both, yeah. It's uh, for both. I mean, you, you can skip each chapter more or less stands on its own, so you can s skip some chapters. Um, yeah, it's not a self-help book. It, you know, it's, it's giving you more an understanding and... Insight. Both. It gives you insight, I think. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it uses yeah. neuroscience, psychology, yeah. psychoanalysis, poetry. There's a lot of poetry oh, and okay. some painting. Um, yeah. I love Edvard Munch's paintings because they show emotion so powerfully and one time I was on that bridge in Copenhagen, Copenhagen where the scream is, um, you know, yeah. and I stood there and screamed and my wife took a picture of me. <laughs> is that in the book? No, it's not in the book. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's but the American tourists on the bus um, did not know what I was doing. No. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, <laughs> Would you mention your little other little book too for any? If you if you force me to, yeah. Um, oh, if short, you force me to, I like that. Short term you can see dynamic psych can't you? Yeah, <laughs> short term <laughs> psychodynamic psychotherapy. I wrote that book for originally for my psychiatry residents as a, a book to learn psychodynamic psychotherapy. It's very clear. It covers a bit on. You know, it looks at the models of ISTDP, it looks at ADP, it looks at aphophobia, and shows the common elements. It shows the history, the evolution, very briefly, of those therapies. Yeah. And then it shows you how to do it. And it only is 200 pages long. And it doesn't have heavy jargon, and it's written in understandable English, I think. Yeah, it's clear, is what you're trying to say, I think. It's clear, it's the thing. Mm. Yeah. And um, I think yeah. it's particularly good for students and supervision. Yeah. And it yeah. also supplements the other, other like, like Alan's book, Alan Abbas's book, and, and John Fredrickson and, and Patricia Cogler's book. I, uh, I, I, uh, I liked just the easy way you've written it all. And, um, and there's a lot of lovely illustrations for any. Um, uh, learning therapists there that um, yeah the the others um, explain it all but this sort of is quite concise and it's easy to pick up and look look at and I also always keep Nat Kuhn's little uh, glossary sort of book close by as well and it's oh, another Kuhn, yeah. Yeah. similar one yeah so thank you so much Alan and can I just wind it up for people to see that attachment creates a, um, a flowing mood, attachment, secure attachment, a flowing mood, a sense of, of presence in our lives. But when it's broken, our mood is disrupted. And then that sense of presence is broken. And then we further down in his book, he talks about time. And, but we didn't have enough time to actually get into time, unfortunately. Mm. And, of course, when, when time is disrupted, then that's when our pain system comes up, I think. Mm -hmm. But we haven't explored that enough mm -hmm. yet. But the important part of speaking with Alan is about the fact that centrality to our humanness is attachment because we're a herd animal. We need attachment for our own secure intergenerational growth, for our own ability to nurture the next generation and the generation after that. So thank you, Alan. And again, we could spend 11 hours on your book. Uh, <laughs> yep. We don't have it. But we'll thank you again. We'll be back for sure. Thank you so much. You're have welcome. A day. Bye, Rose. Yeah. I'm going to bed. Bye, Tova. Good night. Bye, Alan. God bless everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Next week. Bye.